Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the previous video we added the material asset type and used the shader compilation in order to create and save a material that can be used as a default material. When we want to use a material for rendering, the shaders that belong to that material as well as any textures that are going to be sampled by those shaders have to be uploaded to the engine. We also need to provide the engine with this information in order to create the material itself. We have already seen how shaders are sent to the engine, and from our test application, we know that we have to call the create resource function in order to upload assets of any type. Now we want to use the editor to do this instead of hard coding it. Since the same assets can be used for multiple objects within the scene, we are going to make sure that we upload such an asset only once and use its ID for reference. In order to avoid having to read an asset file every time that's referenced by the editor, we'll remember some of its properties in the form of metadata. To this end, I add a new abstract method to the asset base class, which all asset types derive from, and therefore we'll have to implement the new method. While we are here, I also add a method to get a list of referenced assets. This way we can get a reference to any textures that are used by a material. We'll also need a method to construct an instance of asset info directly from the asset itself. Until now, we could only obtain asset info by either using the asset registry or by reading it directly from the asset file. However, when an asset is already loaded, we can simply use the information that's already there. We are now ready to write the code that uploads asset data to the engine. I'll add a new class that's similar to the one we use for uploading shaders. Again, here we make sure that each asset is uploaded only once by using a reference count. So when the asset is uploaded successfully for the first time, we remember its content ID and if it's used more than once, we increase its reference count. We also remember its asset info, metadata and any other assets that are referenced by this asset. This list is only used internally and is therefore private. We keep track of uploaded assets using a dictionary where the asset GUI is used as a key. Note that this dictionary is a static private field. Next, we have a static method for uploading an asset to the engine. This is a private method and it will be called by a public method which I'll add later. It takes an instance of asset info and optionally an already loaded asset. If the asset parameter is null, we'll use the asset info to load an asset of that type. So far, we only have geometry assets, texture assets, and material assets. For reasons that we'll discuss in the next video, we never upload a material asset directly. Instead, we'll use a material after it's been applied to a submesh. Therefore, here we only create either a geometry or a texture depending on the asset type. Furthermore, we have to add new constructors for these asset types that take an asset info and use it to load the asset file. This is done simply by calling the load method with the asset file path. The code is exactly the same for both asset types. At this point, we should have a loaded asset. Before uploading it, we first upload any other assets that are referenced. Instead of calling this method recursively, we'll call another method which will make sure that the assets are uploaded only once. I'll write this method in a minute. After uploading all referenced assets, we can proceed to upload the asset itself. 
To do so, we acquire a byte array that contains the asset data by calling the pack for engine method. If the byte array contains any data, then we create a new instance of uploaded asset and initialize its members. The content ID is returned when a resource is created with this asset data. As you can see, we have to implement the API method in order to call the corresponding engine function. This instance of uploaded asset can be used to unload it when it's no longer needed. We can do this simply by calling the destroy resource API method, which we again have to write a bit later. The previous two methods just called the engine API methods in order to upload the contents of an asset. However, if you want to make sure that each asset is uploaded only once, we'll have to do a bit more bookkeeping. This next method is added for this purpose. Here we first check if an asset with this GUI is already uploaded to the engine. If that's the case, we increment its ref count. We also increment the ref count for all of its referenced assets. If the asset wasn't already uploaded, we'll call upload asset to engine, which is the method that we just wrote. If it returned a valid content ID, we'll then add a new entry to the uploaded asset dictionary. At the end, we return a reference to the uploaded asset. This is the minimum we have to do in order to keep track of which assets have been sent to the engine. Note that in the future, we'd also need to handle the case where such an asset is re-imported by the user and therefore also needs to be refreshed in the game engine. We'll handle that use case in a later video. Remove from scene method recursively calls itself for each referenced asset. Then it decrements the ref count for the uploaded asset and unloads it from the engine when the ref count reaches zero. In that case, it will also remove it from the dictionary and set its content ID to invalid. For any asset, we can try to get its content ID using its GUI. If the asset has been uploaded, then it should return a valid content ID. Otherwise, an invalid ID is returned. Finally, the uploaded asset can only be instantiated by the static methods. Now let's add the API methods for calling the engine functions. We need to be able to call create resource and destroy resource functions which are implemented in the content namespace of the engine. So we need to import these functions here. In case of create resource, we have to copy the data from a byte array to a memory block that can be accessed by C++. I'll implement this method in the next episode. This is because we have to initialize the engine from the editor before we are able to really create resources and that comes with its own set of complications which we'll tackle like the real programming champs that we are. For now, this will have to do. Here I forgot to update this return value to id type. Next, we need to export these functions from the engine DLL. Again, I'll defer their implementation to the next episode. I'm reordering these functions to match in both C# -sharp and C++ code. Now that we are pretty much done with uploaded assets, we have to update the classes that derive from the base asset class to implement the getMetadata method. 
The geometry class is the most complicated since it has levels of detail and submeshes. Each asset type will have an associated metadata class that derives from asset metadata base class. For geometry assets, we'd like to keep some information about each submesh in the geometry hierarchy. This is the mesh name, an icon that displays only that submesh, index count, vertex count, and the number of triangles. One or more submeshes are contained in a level of detail. Here we want to keep the LOD name and the threshold, and of course the list of mesh information for all submeshes. The geometry metadata is then simply a list of LOD info. In Get Metadata, we use the information in an LOD group. This is only possible if the geometry asset has been loaded. In that case, for each LOD, we get the name and threshold. And for each mesh within the LOD, we get the information that we want to keep. Note that we want to generate an icon for each submesh, which means that we have to provide the index of the submesh to the method that generates the icon. We'll update this method to use the index. I'll add an optional parameter for the index that's passed to render to bitmap method. Now we have to update this method by giving it an index parameter. Then we can specify which submesh we want to render by calling setGeometry with the provided index. That's all for geometry metadata. Let's do this for the texture class next. Similar to geometry, we add a class for texture metadata and derive from asset metadata. In this case, we only need some basic information like texture width, height, and format. The implementation of get metadata is therefore quite straightforward. We don't implement get metadata for material assets because, as I mentioned, we don't upload materials directly to the engine. We'll do something similar for applied materials in the next video. I'm not sure if we'll ever need a constructor that loads a material like we have for geometry and texture, but I'll add it just in case. Applied materials is the subject of the next video. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.